evening, everyone. I'm Nancy Tagg, Director of the Graduate Program in Branding and Integrated Communications, or BIC, at the City College of New York. I'm so excited to welcome you all to our second at BIC lecture in our fall 2020 lead-in series. Leaders, mentors, and vice versa is a conversation between Paul Kim, CEO of No Dot Careers and Senior Fellow at City College, and Sarah Irby, Director of New Brands at Unilever. Let me tell you why I'm so excited about this conversation on leadership and the value of mentorship. As the only master's degree program to teach branding and integrated communications in an integrated way, BIC inspires students to work in a cross-disciplinary collaborative environment. And that's not just with each other, but through partnerships with the industry. Such cross-pollination is particularly dynamic when it comes in the form of mentorship. Tonight, we're gonna to learn how to be better at that from both sides of the relationship. Over the years, our at BIC lectures have welcomed industry thought leaders, heavy hitters, authors, and provocateurs to campus, including IPG CEO, Michael Roth, Sir Martin Sorrell, Paula Scher, and George Lois. This fall, our at BIC lectures focus on leading in and to me, nothing exemplifies true leadership more than giving back and mentoring others. But please note, this is not the final at BIC lecture in our Leading In series. That honors goes to Leading With Intention, featuring Shamika Brown and Julius Dunn on Thursday, December 3rd, with limited slots. Please check out tonight's chat for registration information so you can reserve your seat next month. But now, Let's get on with tonight's conversation, leaders, mentors, and vice versa. This topic evolved from my ongoing talks with the amazing Paul Kim. As a senior fellow at the City College of New York, he uses his 20 plus years as a veteran of Wall Street, specializing in global technology, media, and telecom sectors to create innovative curriculums and real life educational experiences for college students. When we talked about developing an at BIC that put a spotlight on mentorship with a been there, done that business leader, Paul told me he knew just who to call, Sarah Irby. Sarah is director of new brands at Unilever, who's launched over a hundred new products and overseen engagement strategies for millions of consumers worldwide. Sarah was recently featured as one of 17 black women executives redefining the face of beauty by Essence Magazine. In addition to sharing her thoughts on mentorship tonight, she'll also talk a bit about the development of her most recent brand, Mele, a science-based skincare for melanin-rich skin. So I'm really looking forward to this conversation. And not only will Paul and Sarah be talking to each other, They've saved a little time at the end to talk directly to you. So please put your questions into the Q&A feed as they come up and they'll be able to respond to some of them before the night is through. And with that, and with great excitement, I turn the screen over to Paul Kim and Sarah Irby. Take it away, have fun guys. Thank you. Thanks, Nancy. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Paul Kim, and this is Sarah, and uh, so happy to be here. And as Nancy said, I'm at City College, and I'm a senior fellow, and I also teach a couple of interesting classes that really kind of goes to the heart of what we're talking about, um, which is being proactive and how to manage relationships and networking. And we're going to talk about that in real depth today and to really showcase what that means. Um, and we're going to talk about kind of mentorship, being a mentee, and as um, Nancy mentioned, we're also going to talk about kind of the ins and outs of launching a very interesting and exciting brand within a very large company. Um, so those are the two areas that we're going to cover. Um, yeah, I don't think there needs to be more said about me, but Sarah, do you want to say a little bit uh, more about yourself? Um, sure. Just to kind Absolutely. of say hi to everybody. Absolutely. Um, so it, it, let me ask you, Paul, is this the part where you want to talk about my sort of background or just a quick, a quick bit? Yeah, let's just say we can go right to your background. 
Oh, <laughs> wonderful. So yeah, so um, I, um, as Nancy and Paul had said, I'm actually currently a brand director at Unilever. Um, and I've been here for just over two and a half years. Um, but this is following of an over 20 year career in the beauty industry. Um, I do work in Unilever's beauty and personal care division. So there's consistency there. And um, one of the things that we'll be talking about tonight is absolutely a, a, a beautiful new um, facial skincare brand, which is Beauty. Um, but before Unilever, um, I, I actually, well, let, how about this? We can start at the very beginning, which is my very first job out of college was actually on Wall Street, but I didn't last 20 years like Paul. <laughs> It was for me, it was it was more like three years. I was a financial analyst at Morgan Stanley, um, which was my first job. And it's a really, really great way to get just well-rounded training. Um, but I didn't love uh, finance and numbers and, and uh, math as much as it took to stay there 20 years like Paul. <laughs> I, I was really looking for, for something, something else. So um, I spoke to different people, people in advertising, um, PR, um, what else did I do? Marketing, obviously. Um, I even talked to people in uh, art dealing because I was, I was like, I like business. I know I want to be in business, but I'm not loving this, this Wall Street thing. Um, so I wish I could find something that I could be passionate about and also you know, still be in business. So um, of all the people I talked to, the marketing um, sounded the most interesting because it's just, it's super well-rounded, right? So it's a little bit of um, strategy, it's numbers, it's creativity, it's working in teams, um, it's, it's pre presenting and um, really brings all the different elements together. And I don't know if some people have heard that expression that a marketer is often um, a jack of all trades, but master of none. <laughs> so we often know a little bit enough to be dangerous um, about different aspects of business um, and you can kind of bring it all together. So um, I decided to get my MBA in marketing um, and international business and I went to NYU. And during that, and actually uh, Paul, should we share that that's where we met? Yes, exactly. That's where um, a lot of connections are made in business school. And I think, um, yeah, it's, um, it was not too long ago, right, Sarah? Because we're super young. Oh, yes. <laughs> We've managed to have a 20 year career and just remain just out of business school. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We're, we're fresh millennials. <laughs> so um, during our time there, it was a nice summer in between the business school years that I did an internship at Revlon and just fell in love with the beauty industry. And, and um, was so excited to have something that I could be passionate about um, and you know, be in business. And so but then after business school, I ended up joining L'Oreal um, full-time out of business school because first of all, L'Oreal is the world's leading beauty conglomerate. Um, and they've got different divisions. They've got their prestige division, um, and their mass division and also a professional division. So an example of their prestige brand would be Lancome. Um, whereas their mass brand, an example would be well, L'Oreal, Paris, Maybelline, Garnier, Fructis. Uh, and um, then they also have professional, like professional hair, things that you would find in a salon. So world's leading conglomerate, um, another great place to receive training. Um, um, but anyway, I, I, uh, I was there for just under two years, then I had an opportunity to go work um, for another beauty company called Calvin Klein Cosmetics, and um, we were eventually acquired by Cody, and um, then I ended up working um, on Bath and Body, the Bath and Body category. By the way, when I was at L'Oreal, I was in makeup, makeup, um, so lip and eye and uh, uh, products, and then um, after being at Cody for about six years, I worked on Bath and Body, I worked on fragrance. Um, and then I had the opportunity to go over to the Estee Lauder companies. And um, there I was, um, um, I was there for over 12 years. Um, and I worked on the Estee Lauder brand. And then I worked on the Bobby Brown brand. Um, and then my last position there was I was vice president of global marketing for Tom Ford Beauty, which is a pretty hot, sexy brand, um, super fast growing, very, very premium. 
Um, and I had an incredible time. So um, whether I planned it that way or not, I ended up working at the top three beauty companies in the world, L'Oreal, Estee Lauder, and Cody, not in that order. Um, and after nearly four years in my Tom Ford beauty role, and I did my Bobby Brown role for nearly five years. I mean, that time really flew by. Um, and that's where I was doing consumer marketing and a lot of consumer CRM strategies, digital marketing, social media, the e-commerce team dot line into me. So that was an incredible learning experience. Um, at Tom Ford, I was over, over all of marketing product and consumer. Um, but I, I, it started just feeling a little sort of like redundant and I was, it's just kind of the same thing. And over, you know, over 12 years in the company, I thought I, I'd had a good run. And uh, through networking, I actually um, met someone who had just joined Unilever and as the head of um, their beauty and personal care division. And she said, you know, we could really use someone like you at Unilever with a true beauty background um, because um, Unilever, you know, is a, is a giant company. I mean, they've got food, they've got home care, they've got beauty and personal care. So they've got anything from Lipton to, to seventh generation <laughs> to Ben Jerry's um, to brands like Dove and Axe and Suave. And, um, and, and what they do at Unilever actually is cross pollinate their people. So someone may grow up in ice cream and then be promoted and lead the skin cleansing business, which is over Dove and Axe and Suave and all those brands that have body washes and such. Um, so you, you've got people running these beauty businesses who, who, who may not have worked at those big beauty companies. So she's like, we can really use someone like you. So I came over um, and it's been great. And uh, one of the most exciting things that actually something that started working from day one was um, the brand I was going to tell you a little bit more about this evening, but um, why don't I pause there? Awesome. So everybody, as you can tell, um, Sarah's super accomplished, but at the same time, super approachable, and um, it, that's not by accident. I think uh, I think a lot of people think that success in business means they have to be super competitive and have sharp elbows, and that is not the case. It's a very collaborative environment. And you have to be kind of a jack of all trades. At the same time, you have to be teamwork oriented and also be a leader. So these are all not uh, easy to do and to do it in an integrated fashion. I think that's sort of what we're going to talk about. So we're going to talk about that being how do you get there? Uh, mm -hmm. But before that, um, I, let's go to your new brand. And, well, actually, would you mind if I kind of piggyback off of what you just said? Yeah, yeah. When you were saying, you know, and the importance of being approachable and that, you know, sharp elbows. It's, it's quite, as you said, Paul, it's quite the opposite. It's required to get along with people, to be likable, approachable. Um, you can't get anything done, certainly not in a function like marketing that you are literally dependent upon all the other functional teams. I could not launch a new product if R&D formulators didn't develop the stuff that goes inside. I could not put it on the shelf if the packaging engineers and the creative people who design and make the packaging, not just, well, the engineers are gonna make it function, right? And then the creative people will make it beautiful. I, I don't have an art, engineering degree, an art degree. You can't get anything done as a marketer without all of the um, people who are supporting and all the different functions in the cross group. And it absolutely is true that um, it's, it's, it's an art you have to, um, I personally, I would say I had to develop over the years. So I feel like some people are just born, you know, those natural people skills and just get along with everyone and approach one friendly. I can be um, pretty intense <laughs> at work and, um, and, you know, just kind of want to get right to the point. Let's plan this out. What do we need to do? What do we need to get done? What's up next? But, you know, that doesn't fly. And I definitely received feedback um, early on in my career that, you know, you know, start with, you know, how was your weekend? <laughs> you know, if somebody's getting married, you know, how's dress shopping going? You know, um, you can't just dive right in to the business at hand. Um, relationship building is, is critical. So I'm, I'm so glad you brought that up because um, um, that is something that you, it's a balance that you have to develop over the years to, 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 to be successful. 
Oh, definitely. Yeah. So I'll give you all a, a little inside thing about Sarah while in business school. She was known as the intense one. Um, no, and, are you serious? Yeah, that's what I heard. <laughs> and, <laughs> um, but intense in the sense that you were organized, you were very organized, which I think a lot of people, especially when you're a bit younger. Um, so I think that was her strength. I think what Sarah is saying is that you just build on that, you know, that organization and that uh, get it done attitude is super important. And there are other people in this company and um, you have to pay attention to that. And a lot of students that I have, especially the ones that, that really want, they're, let's say, ambitious, um, they just want to get good grades and they think that's how to do it or be good at functional skills, not realizing very important. But then if everyone hates your guts, um, you're not going to get very far. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's, that's an important thing to get across and you may want to work on your soft skills. Um, <laughs> love it. So glad we landed yeah. that, um, in the soft. Absolutely. Wow. It went all the way back to business school. Hmm. Yes. <laughs> it's, but it, instead in the best way, because basically everyone else was messy, lazy, and unorganized. And you're the only person that kept the team going <laughs> basically. And I think everyone was grateful. Yeah, everyone was grateful, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and the, yeah, those people are super important. And uh, yeah, it's just a matter of like how as you mature and become a leader, how do you actually become more effective? And yeah, your social capital becomes more important than your hard skills. A hundred percent. Yeah. Anyway, so, so some of the, the, the fun new thing. Uh, definitely. So uh, definitely. So Marlene, do you want to uh, go to the um, the PowerPoint deck that we have? Ah, perfect. Excellent. Beautiful. Beautiful. All right, so, so, go ahead, Sarah. Excellent. So introducing to you um, a new brand, a new spatial skincare brand that just launched um, in September. It's called Mele, the science of melanin rich skin. And if we can go to the next slide, um, just some stats, you know, that this too is America. You know, this is America. Um, 40% of the population in the U.S. is now multicultural. One in two babies born today are multicultural. So that's only accelerating, right? Um, African-American and Hispanic combined spending power exceeds $3 trillion. So, you know, it's a we're a country that's browner than ever, more diverse than ever, and prouder than ever. But believe it or not, um, the skincare industry really was treating all skin the same, right? So it was kind of like, are you dry, combination oily? Uh, you know, do you have acne? Okay, here you go. And it didn't really take into account the specific concerns of melanin-rich skin. So you can see here on the slide, um, that's me with my boss, A.C. Eggleston Bracy, the one who brought me over to Unilever. And she is the head of the beauty and personal care division of, of Unilever for North America. Um, and when she and I raised to our global skincare partners that do most of the development of the new brands, um, this opportunity and this, this need and this underserved consumer group, um, they, were, they, they were completely saw the opportunity as well and the need more importantly. And this kicked off a collaborative process between our Unilever scientists, uh, dermatologists of color, and also real people from black communities, brown communities that we tapped into and we called them our community lab. And this was actually a two years in the making. So as I mentioned to you, I've been at Unilever two and a half years. So it's now, and now and it was July, 2018 when it all kicked off. And um, what we wanted to do was really to dig in and understand what were the unmet needs what were the pain points? And you know, where were the things like that? I just wish I had a product that did X um, and really address the highest order concerns. So um, this is where the idea sort of came from, but then led to the collaboration. And if we go to the next slide, I'm trying to remember, yeah. So this is basically what I was speaking to. So there go the, the three dermatologists that we co-created with um, and also the consumers. And if we go to the next slide, let's see, yes. So here's the range itself. And let me just say that um, brown skin and skin with melanin in it, um, um, it's, it's like magic. So first of all, you age more slowly, you wrinkle less, you have built-in SPF up to 13 SPF built-in. 
Um, and so all of that magic um, is a really, really great thing. But this, at the same time, that same melanin that, that does all those great things, it can actually cause some special concerns and, and needs. So the number one concern is hyperpigmentation, which means producing more color than you want in certain places. So it can lead to dark spots um, or uneven skin tone. So those are two of the biggest concerns. Also people with melanin rich skin tend to have moisture imbalance, um, enlarged pores, and um, also believe it or not, undetected sun damage. Because even though we have built in SPF, all ethnicities and skin tones should really have sun protection pack factor of 30 to 50 because that sun out there is fierce <laughs> and those UV rays, you know, attack everyone, you know, equal opportunity attacking. Um, also, I'm sure everyone knows and the importance um, of protecting your skin now against blue light, right? So that's the, the light that comes off of your computer screen, your phone, um, that we're all just constantly with now more than ever. Um, SPF can also protect against that. So we developed the range to, to address all of these needs. So what you see there is um, we have an um, even tone tonic, we have an SPF 30 that goes on perfectly sheer because one reason a lot of people with melanin rich skin don't use SPF, in addition to the myth that they think they don't need it, for people who do know they need it, um, very often the skincare, the, rather the sunscreen that's out there leaves this sort of white residue on a deeper skin tone. So this goes on completely translucent. Um, and then that one, I'll just highlight one other product, which is that one in the middle there that has the two different colors, the yellow and the red, that's called a biphase. So if you moved it around, the liquids move around, but you shake it up and then you put it all over and that's our dark spot control serum. So just gives you a sense for, you know, all the products that we have that are addressing those concerns. And let's see what we had next there. Yes, so voila, <laughs> um, these are the people that we're looking to serve. So um, um, people with, with, you know, sort of from tan to deeper brown skin. Um, you could look at it as, you know, Hispanic, African-American, South Asian, um, or people who would just say, those are my concerns too, you know. So this is it. And then I think I had one last slide which was, and if you build, so if you're curious um, to learn more about Mele, feel free to take, we have a diagnostic that we developed just for melanin rich skin. Um, so you can take our diagnostic at our meleskincare.com. And if you want, you can check us out um, on Target. We're on target.com. And that was it. Awesome. All right, uh, thanks Marlene. Um, so the one, before we get to the mentor and mentee, um, mm -hmm. Uh, issue or you know, the things that we're going to talk about. Um, the one question I have with this launch, uh, I'm sure there's like a thousand questions I have, but since we have time issues, um, the one question I asked, what was the experience, and this is sort of a little bit inside baseball, um, what was the experience of launching this brand uh, in a gigantic Anglo-Dutch conglomerate? And can you just kind of explain that experience? Yes. So I would say the kickoff of it went extremely smoothly. One thing that helped is look who's at the top, right? You have the head of the beauty and personal care division of North America, one of the biggest markets for Unilever globally, saying this is a need in my market and having the data to back it up. And also Unilever is a very purposeful company. And they like to not just sell people products, but to serve people beyond just products. What are we going to do to have a real community impact? And we knew that this, a brand like this could, could, could live up to all of those things. So it was hard to argue with the data and you had somebody at the top who could, you know, she had a seat at the table and she, she was listened to. So that went very, very well, but believe it or not. And then we worked on developing it. It was very collaborative. As I told you, we approached it from a very purposeful spirit and we involved all the right people. Um, and, but believe it or not, right before it was time to launch, with all of the Black Lives Matter um, things that were going on, um, people got cold feet. And they said, oh, if we come out with this now, people could think that we're being opportunistic or just trying to jump on a trend. Oh, you know, people of color are crying out, uh, here's some skincare for you. So people got a lot of cold feet. And we actually had to fight <laughs> um, with AC, myself, and the people who worked on developing it 
we had to get all the right people to say, trust us, you know, let us give, at least give us a shot. This is a much needed um, um, range. It's, it's long overdue. Um, and so they agreed uh, to let us launch it, but we had to go back and retest all of our communication, which were the, the, like all of our ads and all the things to make sure that in this climate, that it would not be taken in the wrong way. It wasn't. The testing showed um, it was okay to proceed. We also came up with a 72 question crisis management document. Like, what if they say, how many, you know, how many people of color even worked on this launch? You know, um, what is Unilever's, you know, um, employee makeup in terms of the rest of the demographics of the US? Um, you know, what about that skincare brand that you sell over on the other side of the world? Um, you know, that, that is like whitening products and lightening products because over in Asia, they like that. Um, and they're like, well, what, you know, how could you have a company that sells whitening in Asia selling to brown people here? So, um, um, and, and as it turns out, um, those products aren't whitening products. They're more give you a glow, but it's like they're perceived that way. So we had all of these, you know, crisis management and, and we, we, put on all of our, our armor and our gear and we launched and we've been accepted really in the spirit in which we launched, which is a long overdue solution for people with brown skin who had felt ignored by the skincare industry. In fact, there was a survey in January, 2020 that said 63% of women of color feel ignored by the skincare industry. They, 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 don't, they didn't think that we were like trying to be, pretend to be black owned, that we, we talked about the origins that it was, you know, two Unilever executives that um, had the vision to launch this and collaboration with terms of color and people of color. And, and so people heard our message and have accepted it and have embraced us. Um, so we have amazing ratings and reviews. We have a great following in social and um, wear some wood, knock on wood so far. Um, it's been well received. Oh, that's amazing. It is uh, the irony of it is, is so interesting where it, um, the company didn't want to be perceived as being kind of exploitative. Yeah. And, and it's that uh, not all companies are evil, <laughs> you know, yeah. just thoughtful, right? I think uh, uh, probably understandably cautious because you don't want to be that Peloton or I forget that whole Diet Coke campaign where that was just tone deaf, right? I think that's the fear. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it takes a lot of people. And it's, I think it probably speaks volumes to kind of your position as well and your bosses um, in the sense that the company did ultimately have to trust you, right? Yes. And, and you have to garner that uh, trust and that effectively that power, you know? Yeah. So um, yeah, so interesting. So uh, we're now going to move on to the mentor-mentee phase of our discussion. Yes. <laughs> so, yes. uh, so my question to you, Sarah, is uh, uh, maybe perhaps talk to one example in which um, maybe in the beginning you, when you were a mentee and how you, you know, kind of the mistakes you've made perhaps and perhaps like the good things you've done and now as more of a mentor mm -hmm. and kind of that as well and kind of like play off kind of like younger Sarah versus um, more experienced Sarah. Sure, sure. So the first thing I thought I would share is sort of like the different buckets of men men mentoring. Um, so to me, there's sometimes you have sort of like a life mentor, someone that maybe you know from outside of your place of employment, so outside of where you actually work, the company where you work, um, who's kind of guiding you um, as you move through life. Sure, it's career, but it also could be broader than career, but the point is they're not in your company uh, day to day and they have the little distance removed so they can maybe give you some advice without knowing all of that or, you know, yeah. Part, they aren't part of the internal politics and dynamic, dynamics of your company. And I would say it was that kind of a life mentor who helped me the most in my early years. I can't, I don't really remember having um, mentors within my company um, early on. I, I had bosses, you know, um, or people who, you know, who thought I was, you know, an up and coming, you know, talent in the company or wanted to, you know, invest in me or, you know, promote me or, um, uh, I had more of that than like somebody that I would like meet with at work. Um, and, but then I'd say sort of by the time I hit Estee Lauder companies, um, so now I'm like, uh, 10 years into my 20 years of, you know, beauty. Um, I did have, um, a boss who also was a mentor and guess what? He also was somebody that we went to business school with. 
because and, and the, my lesson here to you is a mentor can sometimes be a peer. So a peer. So um, th that was incredibly important. Um, so when he, he, he actually hired me into the company um, when he was vice president and he brought me in as an executive director. Um, and we worked together for about a year and a half, but then he got promoted and became the senior vice president of marketing for Mac Cosmetics, which is pretty cool. So I thought I would just say that for all the Mac fans out there. And I remained on the Estee Lauder brand. So he was able to really be a true mentor to me because he was no longer like my day-to-day -day -day boss. And he knew the players, right, inside the company. And when I hit those rough patches and ended up with a boss who was like trying to kill me, <laughs> uh, like she was really trying to kill me, um, publicly shamed me, undermined me, like, I was supposed to go on a trip to Asia to present, you know, um, with everyone else, with my peers. And um, um, she like told me I couldn't go, to, you know. So he knew her and by the way, she didn't last. She ended up, <laughs> yeah. A lot of times when, when you meet people, when you, when you run into people in companies that are just awful, awful, awful to you, you're probably not alone. That's something else that would be good for people to know. Um, and just ride it through and you take the high road and you just keep being professional. And, and a lot of times those things, those people get worked out. So, but he coached me through that. Like literally when she was trying to get me to quit, she was like, you know, this job is really hard. <laughs> are, you, are you sure? Like, you really want to put yourself through this? And he told me, just tell her you want to learn from her just that you do. And he was just like, buy time, buy time, just get that time on your resume so that, you know, when you do ultimately move, you don't, um, it doesn't look like it was, you were there too short. And he was absolutely right. Um, I also had um, somewhere around that time frame too, a sponsor. So there's such a thing as a corporate sponsor. And um, that is someone who's going to be way high up in the company who literally can make or break your career, who literally can see opportunities. They have that bird's eye view of things that are happening on different brands or different you know, functional needs. And they can say, I have somebody you know, for you over here. They, they, they look out for you, they, um, they back you up. And um, so I had that as well at Estee Lauder companies. Um, and that was my mentor's mentor. <laughs> Um, and he took his own interest in me because um, he saw me in meetings. He knew Guillaume uh, really liked me uh, and he liked me himself. So that's also a thing um, is having a corporate mentor. So um, they definitely helped to keep me lifted up when somebody was trying to beat me down. They helped me also know when it was time to maybe make a move, even if it meant making a lateral move. Um, and they are critical. Um, so that's kind of like my mentoring experience. Do you want me to talk about like my mentees now? We have like a few minutes. Yes, uh, but one, one follow-up question yeah. on your being a mentee. So what do you think? What was the, the thing that made you such a good mentee? Why are these people backing you? Okay, I think, <laughs> I'm just gonna say what I think. I think there's three things that come to mind. One, I think they saw the potential in me and I think they believed in me. And I, you know, uh, people aren't gonna waste their time with someone who they don't think is of value to, you know, to the company. So first of all, I think they believed in me. Second of all, um, I was very respectful of them and deferent to, deferent to them and I listened to them and I followed their advice. So if they gave me the advice, I followed it. Um, and I also uh, made a point to you know, reach out to them um, when I needed them, but not too much. And I also tried to have you know, my own, uh, potential solution to maybe whatever problem I was facing so that you don't just call them up and say, this happened and this happened and this happened, what do I do? You know, you, you, you say, this is what I'm going through. This is what I think I should maybe do. And then you let them sort of like weigh in. So, um, and you have to seek them out, right? You, 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 yeah. So you have to be respectful of their time um, and seek them out when you need them and, and come with some of your own solutions. But they're going to tell you what to do anyway, because that's, you know, <laughs> if you have the right kind of mentor, they'll tell you what to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I guess the key is just don't just sit there in your desk. And if things are going bad, sob at your desk. You have to put your big girl, big boy pants on right. and start speaking up for yourself, right? That's right. Self-advocating. 
as they tell my children in school all the time, self-advocate. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's that's the amount of saying. Yeah. Um, fantastic. So, uh, how about now, since yeah. you're in this elevated position? Um, then how do how do you view being a mentor now? Yeah. So I actually have two mentees going on right now. Um, one is um, sort of a life. I'm a, her life. So I'm like her life mentee, like that person, Carla Harris, was for me from Morgan Stanley. Um, so I'm her life mentee, and she is actually somebody who sought me out while she was still a senior in college from my college, Spelman College, and she, um, you know, reached out and like got on my schedule through the alumni affairs office, and we had we met for coffee in Soho, and she was like, I want to get into the beauty industry. This is what I want to do. All these banks are trying to recruit me, but I don't. Want, I already have a job waiting for me at some financial institution, but I don't want that. I want beauty, and she was so motivated and. To, clear-headed on what she wanted, I was like, this is fantastic because I, I didn't even have that clarity when I was, you know, a senior in college. So I helped her out. I got her an internship at Cody, where I still had great relationships because I worked on my relationship skills. <laughs> That's where I did a lot of my work on my relationship skills was at Cody. Um, um, and, and I tell you, she stayed in touch with me through the years at different companies. She was with Cody, then she went to Avon. And now she's um, in London, still with Avon, and she's been through many bosses and many different positions. And um, she finally doesn't really call me for career advice anymore. <laughs> she made it. She made it. Um, my other mentee example is actually a formal mentee I have at Unilever. So I literally was assigned a mentee. She's brand new to the company. She's um, in our kind of like you, it's the training. It's like the starter starter position where you rotate um, a one year at a time through different functions until you figure out what you like the most. And so um, she's really great in that she schedules, and I did encourage her to do this and she does it, which is she schedules, a, we do a monthly connect and we talk about how are things going in her new roles. Um, she'll ask me questions. Um, I give her advice. And she like writes down everything I say. And she's like, oh, that's good. That's, you said that so perfectly, you know. Um, and I put her in touch with different people. So like, for example, she told me something she was working on and I knew somebody who used to do what she was doing. So I put them in touch. Um, and then I was explaining something to her. We just did our connect last week. I was like, oh, this is perfect time uh, for this call coming up. And um, she, I was explaining to her some different terminology and, um, I was like, well, you know, like, do a 6P analysis and at Unilever it's a 7P analysis. And she was like, I'm sorry, what is that? I only know about four Ps, <laughs> you know, place, product, promotion, your price, you know. And I was like, well, at Unilever there are six because we also talk about purpose and, um, you know, performance and some other things. So then I sent her a document that was a 6P evaluation and she's like, oh my God, this is so perfect. So um, she does a good job of reaching out to me regularly with pointed questions. And then I try to do a good job, um, maybe pointing to her, pointing her to people or even examples um, that will help enrich her and get her, get her kind of up to speed faster than maybe she didn't have somebody like me, you know, um, to talk to. That's so, so what do you think, um, let's say you're a mentor, what are you, to put it very bluntly, what are you looking for in a mentee? What do you? What will get you to be their advocate more? Mm -hmm. So certainly someone who is, um, you know, a high potential talent, and I know that because of their attitude, of their energy, um, of their, you know, enthusiasm for, for what they're working on, um, or knowing when something's not right and a willingness to um, you know, try to make it right, whether it's um, you know, trying something different or a different function or a different, um, a different boss. Um, you, you know, so somebody who um, um, you know, has a sense of self and a sense of you know, direction of where they're headed and are just looking for some guardrails and, and mentoring along the way. Um, yeah, and then who's, you know, who's respectful of your, of your time um, and who follows your advice? Because if you're going to take the time to give them the advice, you want to know that they're, they're following it and, and then let you know how it went. 
Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree. I think, um, at least for me, I've noticed a lot of young kids, they, I don't know where they get this advice, but they're very transactional. So they want to mm -hmm. use you to get some contact and they just drop you like a hot potato. And I sit there and like, that's the dumbest thing I've ever seen. Um, but I think there's that, I don't know where they get it. <laughs> I think it's this hustle culture or whatever it is. Um, but I, I don't think uh, it's underappreciated that this is, you're trying to build lifelong relationships and of, of mutual respect and mutual value added. Um, and uh, I think that's kind of the short term nature, I think is, is um, I think what's, um, you know, the downfall of a lot of people. <laughs> mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's yes, it, people can see through transactional spirit um, pretty quickly. Pretty yeah, quickly. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So we but call at it the BS, same time, right? Yeah. But at the same time, you don't want it to become too like you're their new best friend. <laughs> so it's that balance between I'm respectful of your time. I would really love to talk about this, this, and this, but at the same time, respect that, you know, you have a little of that rapport building as well. Yeah, absolutely. But yeah, but and I'm not so... your new best friend either. <laughs> yeah, right, right. And I think that's a great point because it's, this is so hard for young people because you, you're not there yet in terms of professionalism and you're sort of pretending to be professional yet you don't know how to strike this balance. Mm -hmm. I think this is where the sweet spot is and no one teaches it, right? And so I think it's very hard to learn. And um, yeah, and this is sort of what we're talking about, how to, at least this, hopefully this discussion will help, hopefully uh, the people on this call uh, kind of try to understand it and try to really focus on it rather than sort of this transactional nature or the hard skills or just, I'm just gonna use you to get to that contact and I'm done with you. And <laughs> uh, I've seen that too much. Um, before we go on the, oh, we're running well behind, before we go into Q&A, um, let's talk about, I think, a topic that a lot of young people are really interested in, which is sort of, and we said it a lot, this kind of purpose nature. And Unilever is such an interesting company because it is, it's obviously it's European, um, but I think it's one of the few companies in which it's not corporate BS, right? I think the purpose, the, for each brand to have purpose or it doesn't belong in the portfolio, that approach, it's relatively rare. Um, yes. So can you just talk about that? What does it really mean from at least a senior person on the inside? What is it What are? What is it about that that we don't know, perhaps on the outside? Absolutely. So I can tell you, for example, that the whole company's purpose is to make sustainable, li sustainable living commonplace. So, right? So sustainable from packaging, impact to the planet, um, making, an, uh, making a contribution to your community. Um, all of those things that you think about um, you know, uh, you know, yeah, the impact, you know, they want to be net positive on people and the planet, um, I think is a, the most succinct way to say that. So that drives everything. It drives everything. And it costs more, meaning the cost of creating something that's sustainable, it costs more. Um, so they are making an investment in the planet and in people as a part of their business model. Um, so that's one thing you should know is to make sustainable living commonplace, USLP. Um, and then another thing is that we say, and it's part of our compass, um, is, let's see if I get this right. Um, yeah, so yes, brands with purpose grow, um, people with purpose thrive, and companies with purpose last. And it's kind of like this little, you know, three part circle that goes around and then off that are spokes of how to bring that to life. So it's absolutely, and that's our compass that guides us where, where, you know, where do we go? So um, they're all about their people living out their purpose um, at Unilever if you can, or if you happen to be working on something that doesn't help you live your purpose, they want you to at least know what your purpose is and have the quality of life and the work-life balance that they make you feel like you can live your purpose. Um, and as you quoted, it sounds like you read that, uh, that article that came out from our CEO. I feel like it was maybe late last spring that you know, if, if we have any brands still in our portfolio that don't have a purpose beyond product, they're not gonna be here much longer. <laughs> so he absolutely did say that. Um, and so that's one thing that's been great about creating the Melee brand is because it's born with purpose embedded. Um, and I didn't really get into what our purpose beyond the product is tonight, and I don't think I have time to anymore. But um, it's going to be it's going to be around closing the gap on the science based knowledge that's out there on melanin rich skin because there's not enough of it. So we're going to do a whole work stream around that. 
Yeah, it is fascinating. I, we should, I mean, we could spend a whole hour on that alone, I think, <laughs> in terms of how, yeah, it's not, um, uh, capitalism is changing and whether people in it like it or not. <laughs> and I think companies like Unilever are forward looking and not just for their own self-interest, but I think there is a holistic aspect of, of how business will evolve that's just been, I think, driven by a lot of young people as well. So there's a lot of pressure. And the question is for a company, are you gonna be ahead of it, the curve or are you gonna be run over by it? And it's a simple choice. And it's amazing how companies, a lot of them are choosing to stick their head in the sand and be gonna be run over by it. And that presents opportunity. But at the same time, I think this is an example in which you don't have to make up the purpose. This is integrated with the brand. And um, I think that's what's, that's powerful because uh, it's authentic, right? And uh, it's almost that business is almost that simple, isn't it? If you try to fake it, it kind of doesn't even feel very good and it's not going to be successful. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. They call it woke washing, you know, like, yeah. Just try to totally. attach purpose to something and people see right through it. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting that all this kind of happened, you know, when you're launched. It was like the opposite of Unilever. It's like, we want to make sure that we're not, you know, uh, doing this in, in the, I don't know, in an exploitative way. And that's, yeah. um, you know, that, that speaks volumes, I think, that a company. Um, and, and you, of course. <laughs> so let me look at the Q&A stuff. Okay. Um, all right, some of this stuff, so I'm going to be pretty harsh about some of this. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, this is all right. Sorry, this is what I do in my class. I'm like, ah, this sucks. <laughs> <laughs> for, the, for those of you uh, uh, in my class. Uh, so some of this stuff, yeah, some of the stuff that we kind of already talked about where there's a this interesting question about kind of the older generation. I think this is the most interesting one. Um, it's the older generation versus younger generation. So what's your take on the power dynamic with the older generation versus the younger generation? That's an world? easy this question. I can, I can answer yeah. that. We have flex to the younger, bottom line. This started when I was at SA Lauder Companies. It has only continued and been even more the case at Unilever. The fact is that millennials, as you know, and I know they, the ones who, can, who are classified as millennials hate to be even called millennials, but they started it all. They, um, what was the number that when I was still at SA Lauder, it was something like millennials represented, uh, it was something like 63% of the workplace or something. So like you have to listen to them. And so literally we have let the youngers shape the culture. And I'll give you a case in point example at Unilever pre-COVID, one of the big changes that they made was they had um, no assigned desks. So when you go in, you just pick a desk. And also, by the way, everyone at all levels, I mean, up to, maybe just not the, the president had an office, right? But everyone at all levels just sat at open desks and you had to clean your desk off by the end of the evening. Um, and you know what, you might, you know, if you get there at the same time of day, every day, you can maybe clean your desk and everybody knows, oh, that's kind of that desk. But if your desk is empty, Somebody can sit in it. And that was one piece. And the other piece was because also they encouraged everyone to work at least one day a week from remotely. And that it, you didn't have to be at home. Maybe you could be in the city because Unilever's in New Jersey. And they said, maybe try to schedule that on a day that you also have a doctor appointment or you also have a parent teacher conference, you know, and just work from home or work remotely. Um, and because of the whole flexible work thing, there's no FaceTime. So people aren't sitting around looking at, oh, who so-and-so is still there at the office? So, and that came from millennials and young people wanting to have more flexibility, wanting to be able to use technology to work from anywhere. Um, so just, yeah, we flex to the young people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because companies have to, um, yeah. definitely. The, we'll kind of, so uh, there's a bunch of questions that are sort of, you know, um, we hope that students ask these high fluting questions, but they don't. Their question is like, well, how can I get a job? I think the best way I can paraphrase all these questions is, or I think what they're trying to say is, um, you know, what if I'm not Sarah, right? Sarah seems so amazing, articulate, put together, smart, all that stuff. What if I'm not that, her? Uh, being such a, you know, conscious, how, how do I get a job? I think that's, you know, and it's yeah. such an interesting question because at, at, at one point, it's, it's kind of meaningless. At the same time, that is the question. Yeah, no, no, how do so, I, I so, that. So, 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 how so this just, is what yeah. I always tell people. Um, first of all, if you want a job, it has, there has to be a job. So just because you know, like I'm talking to everyone tonight and it's a pleasure to speak to all of you, even though I can't see you. Um, and you know, I work at Unilever. 
just because like, oh, I met Sarah and she works at Unilever. Let me hit her up for a job. There, a job has to exist. So uh, the first thing I would tell you to do is to go to our, um, our company website and look into our career section and look through all the open jobs that are there and read the description of the jobs and figure out which ones speak to you, right? It's like, oh, I can imagine myself doing that, you know? Um, and then when you reach out to someone at that company, you'll say, in fact, I'm, I'm, I love Unilever. I love it as a purpose-driven company. I admire it so much. Um, and in fact, you know, there's a job posted on, you know, I better not even say anything specific because it's not true, you know, X brand doing Y function, right? And I um, have always been passionate about this brand and, um, you know, and I, and I have this, that, and the other relatable skills to that function. And, and, and so have a story about the specific job that you researched um, and, and why you think it would be a good fit for it. That is gonna be much more motivational to someone inside the company to forge a resume on along, right? Than just like, I need a job. Can you help me give me a job? Can you send my resume to HR? So that, that's my answer for that. Um, I also saw one, I cheated and looked in the Q&A, but I saw one I would love to answer. I saw, I saw one from someone that said something about how do you know if you're in the right job or not? Something like that. How do you know that once you're in a job, if it's the right job? That's actually part of the advice I give young people, which is, is part of my secret to success, um, is if you can find a job, and this is not new, people probably have heard this other places, but it's true, and I've lived it. If you can find a job that you would want to do, whether you were paid for it or not, um, then you know, you know you've really hit on something because every day that you come to work, you're going to have fun doing it. Um, an, a, a, um, another way of saying it is, you know, even if, okay, fine, you want to get paid for it. It's like, maybe I wouldn't do it for free. But the point is, is that something that makes you want to jump out of bed and enjoy what you do every day. So that's why, sorry, I need some water, <laughs> sorry. That's why I didn't last in finance because even though, you know, grow, you know, my senior and junior year of high school, I used to love to watch the movie Wall Street. And I was like, I wanna to move to New York and be, be a financial analyst and work on Wall Street. And I guess what I did, I got to, that was a big blessing. I actually got to, live what I thought was gonna be my dream job, but I got there and I hated it. It was just numbers and money and money and numbers. And I didn't love either one enough to only do that. So um, doing a job that you aren't liking and it gives you a stomach ache and it's it, it, at least it's a blessing in that you know you've eliminated process of elimination, something you don't wanna do. And I got lucky that my very first internship in business school, I fell in love. <laughs> Um, so I got lucky because, you know, it could take some people two, three, four tries before they find something they really want. But, um, um, the, the trick is to find something that you actually enjoy the content of the work and not just, you know, the paycheck, uh, so that you're not, yeah, just living for that paycheck so that you don't have to be there on the weekend or whatever. Well, that's absolutely true. I think a lot of students that I know, they think like, hey, once I make money, then that will make me happy. And that is the, the biggest myth, I think, out there. hundred <laughs> percent. You know, and I, I just want to go back to kind of like um, the, the simple question, which is, I'm a college student. How do I get a job? And I think what you're saying is, is interesting because I think what I find a lot of students, because they think, well, I'm just going to show up in the interview and then you ask me questions and then I'm going to answer. If I answer them well, then, um, then I'm good. And not realizing, I think, think of the other person. If you're the company or the hiring manager, you think, well, why should this person come here? If you can't answer that simple question for me, in my mind, why should I hire you? And I think that goes to your point, which is then you have to show, well, why are you in front of me? What is it about this company that makes you so interested to work here? If you can't articulate that, why are we talking, right? It's as Absolutely. harsh as that, right? Absolutely. Yes, one should always research the company research, like find out who is the CEO, <laughs> you know, uh, research the company. Um, what are they all about? Um, also know and have a, maybe have a good guess at who maybe are their competitive set, right? Who, who, who are they competing with? Um, and then certainly if you're going to be interviewing for, you know, a company that sells products, uh, go research the product, buy the product if you can afford it, experience the product somehow so that you can formulate an opinion about it. 
Um, and one last point was you can also always, always ask questions, right? Whenever I do a job interview, um, and I've done many over the years, even within a company, sometimes you want to move, you got to interview for that job. Um, I always have to try to have a good five to seven questions um, that, you know, one of the things I, if I'm interviewing outside the company, outside of my company, I'll ask about what's the company culture like, you know, that's a legitimate thing. Um, so you come up with some questions based off of, you know, the job that you're interviewing for the company itself, maybe something about the competition. And then another good one to always just ask about is like, can you explain the company culture, you know, or, um, what, you know, what do you all look for in perspective, a uh, perspective employees? Like what, what are you looking for? Um, and those are two good generic ones you can always put in there, but but yeah, definitely go in there having research and having a good reason as to why um, you should be the person to hire, like you said, Paul. Right, and the, and the little lie you can basically or trying to get across is that this is the only place I want to work, right? Effectively, like how do you communicate that to that person who's going to hire you? Because you have to be that enthusiastic because the job market is that competitive. Mm -hmm. If you can't show the enthusiasm of why this is the only place I want to work, and you should try to find that place, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's basically it. Um, so we're right at 6.59. I think we nailed it in terms of time. Um, so um, Nancy, do you wanna come back in or? I'm popping in. Am yes, I here? Perfect. Oh yeah, my goodness. I, am, I have been listening in. I have been enjoying your conversation so much. It's been so fantastic. Um, and the thing is, as we all know in Zoom, no one can hear you applaud. So while I kind of sing you guys off with amazing thank yous, please, if you could take a moment to look in the chat and you'll get some love from the over 60 people who showed up here tonight to hear from you. I took a lot of notes. Uh, I've been doing this for a long time, but I always love listening and, and being inspired by, by new thinking. I loved the purpose compass. Sarah, I just thought that was so great. I, I just thought it was beautiful. And the other thing you started with that was so terrific to me was you have to be approachable to be a marketer. How, what are you doing in this space if you're not just somebody who pulls things together? You're a problem solver and you're with people. So how can you not be approachable? And I think that's really a great thing to note for the students who think that because you're in a leadership position, you're, you're super powerful. Anybody that can pull off a new product line and, and go to battle for it in the way that you discussed, it seems like, oh my goodness, I can't approach you. But I think what you said is like, it personally, I mean, it's just like where you are in your DNA. So I was really excited to hear you say that. And also you, you come across as very approachable too. So, you know, come on. Um, and then the one thing before we go that I really loved hearing from you, you too, is that you met in grad school. And because Vic is a graduate program, and when the students graduate, I always say, look to your left, look to your right. These are the people that will be supporting you for the rest of your lives. And I am just so moved that the two of you, Paul and Sarah, are examples of that this evening. This is what meeting and collaborating and networking look like, people, later on in your careers. So. And my formal thank you to you, Paul. Thank you so much for keeping our conversation going. Thank you for your commitment to innovation and education. Thank you for probably the most amazing Zoom background I think I've seen uh, since we, we went on the grid in March. Um, and then thank you for introducing us to the amazing Sarah Irby. So thanks to you, Sarah, for sharing your personal journey, your, your, personal, your personality, your <laughs> professional journey, and good luck on your latest launch. That is just super, super awesome. So on behalf of BIC, thank you both for being leaders who believe in being mentors. And thanks for being part of our At BIC lecture series. And finally, thank you all in the audience for coming tonight. Thank you for being here. Don't forget to register for our upcoming at Pick Lecture, Leading with Intention in December. I wish you all a great evening. Thanks again for coming. And everybody, please stay safe. Bye-bye.
Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye.